I guess this week, we've been in the middle of working through this resource called the Bible Project. And the Bible Project has been put together so that this thing called the Bible, God's Word, could be a little more easily understood and approached. I've really enjoyed this journey. We, took, uh, we started in January and we, we, we took the book of Luke on and we found out why Jesus had to come, live, die, and be born again. We went all the way back in Lent to Genesis and we started at the very beginning, God's creativity and his amazingness. And we immediately took what was perfect and broke it, which led all the way through the Old Testament. And then we just kept forgetting and forgetting and forgetting and forgetting and forgetting that this God who was perfect and whole only wants to repair. And then once we're repaired, we shouldn't go back to our brokenness. And we keep going back to that brokenness. So out of Easter, out of Resurrection Sunday, we've now jumped into the book of Acts. Luke started us off this journey. Luke wrote about Jesus. And then in Jesus point two, he shows us what happens at Pentecost. You saw in the video there, Pentecost, this place where they gathered and they waited. This thing that happened in an upper room. Pentecost was already a thing. It was a a holiday, but it was transformed when the Holy Spirit showed up. The only way the Holy Spirit was going to show up is if obedience was happening. Last week, we looked at some of the instructions we were given. Jesus goes back to heaven. And we're waiting like this. Like, what do we do now? And the angels come up on the side and say, hey, what are we looking at? What are you looking for? I thought you were supposed to be in Jerusalem. I thought Jesus said to go and wait. And they were like, oh yeah, come on, we got to go. So they go and they wait and they begin to pray. But remember, we know what they're supposed to be praying for. They don't. They have no idea. They were told to just go and wait. In the middle of that, they begin to pray. Last week, we looked at some of the adverbs about how they were praying. Constantly, continually, together, fervently. Anybody here ever prayed fervently? I mean it. Go ahead and put your hands up if you know what that means. I have prayed fervently, right? If you haven't, it means exactly like it says. You could pray like this. Lord, I hope today's a good day. That's okay. That's a wish. That's you checking in with the Lord, get a little dap, and then, all right. But if you're praying fervently, it does not sound like that. If you're praying continually, it goes way deeper than that because you can't stay and sustain at that level of just a quick little high five and then move on if you're praying continually, constantly, and then you go fervently. But they decided to obey. I told you last week, I'd feel stupid as the pastor. Pastor, why'd you call us here? Well, our instructions were to gather together. Okay, what should we do? I think we should pray. Great, what's the agenda? Uh, I don't know. Okay, what are we paying you for? I, uh, I don't know. I just know that if we're together, we should be praying. Jesus said something's coming. What's coming, pastor? Uh, you're fired. I'm not sure we need you anymore, dog. If we're just supposed to stay and be together and pray, then we can do that. And the truth is, in 2019, the church of Jesus Christ, the church of the ghetto Nazarene and nothing ever good comes out of Nazareth, you know, you know what we, we probably could get by with? Out a ton of pastors. If we already have our, our marching orders, uh, we, we, could probably, we could probably do this. I, I can figure out how to make coffee at Starbucks. I, I, I'll be all right. I don't know. You want to take six months and pray about our staff? I'm, I'm on board for that. Because I'm starting to see some very clear simplicity in Scripture. And it's not overly complicated. And seniors, I want to let you know, while that might be a little bit scary, looking at this next, future, next journey, next future chapter going, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. I will tell you this, scripture's not overly complicated in some of our marching orders. I look around and see some rooms of former seniors who used to be seniors and were asking me those questions like, Stretch, I don't know what I'm going to do next. And now I see some of you who have been 
around the world. And some of you who have uh, raised some funds to figure out this next chapter of your life. Some of you have jumped into careers that were not what your major was, but God was on board moving you ahead. And it took you to kind of tap in to say, God, what are you already up to? What are you about to do? Get me ready for that. The prayer of the unknown might be the actual key component of the follower of Christ. That may be our church's prayer. We don't know, Lord, but we're in. Like we're all the way in. But the problem is, is that prayer evokes this thing. You know what it evokes in Acts, right? The Holy Spirit. Prayer gets us the playbook. We draw up the pray, plays and, and, and we got something, but the Holy Spirit's the only thing that can get us out there to run the play. Any football players in, in the area? Anybody play football here? Back in the day? Yeah, my, they call me stretch because back in the 70s, I was so small, my friends always thought it was funny to have like uh, opposite names. You know, I had a huge friend, so we called him Tiny. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, we had, a, uh, we had a large, like, really large dude. He was like a, a walking square. And we called him Slim. And I was about three foot tall for a long time, and like junior year of high school. And they thought it would be funny to call me Stretch because we knew somebody like 7'2", and they called him Stretch. And they were like, yeah, because you're like the opposite of Stretch. Ah! And I'm 49, and they still call me this. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't always get to pick your name, but you do get to pick what you want to do with this life you've been given. Francis Chan paints a picture of a football game like this. He says, so, so what if we paid money for the NFL game, right? And we get there, and you know they're all hyped up. You know how they're doing fire, the fireworks? They got the, the blow-up thing with the, with the confetti guns, and everybody's like, rah, rah, rah. And, and they just do, do this a lot with their helmets. You know what I mean? They go, rah, rah, rah. And, and then when they come out of the tunnel, they're like, wow, and like, like they're owning the ground. Ah, 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 ah. And get everybody together. And they're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. put the helmets up. Ah, 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 ah. And everybody settles down for a second. They're like, ah, let's get this thing started. Everybody comes out. They put their helmets in the middle like this. They go, all right, what's the play? What are you going to do? You're going to do that? going that way to the left? Done. All right, on three. One, two, three, break. They all walk to the sideline. They stand there for a while. Just settle down. Hold on. It's coming. And they blow a whistle. They come running back out. Yeah! Let's roll! Everybody, the helmet's back in. Oh! They go like this. What's the play? What's the play? All right, this time. We're going to try over the right. I'm not sure that left thing would have worked. I don't know. Let's go to the right. We want to, you pitch it. Yeah, I'm going to pitch it back. You throw it back to me. I'll hit you long. <laughs> All right, on three, let's break. One, two, three, break. Yeah. Oh, come on. Later. Do that later. You know, the sidelines like this. All of a sudden, everybody in the stadium starts to boo. We want our money back. This game stinks. Do something. And the Holy Spirit is the first thing given to us. As soon as the church gathers to pray and stay focused, the Holy Spirit's given as this energizer to say, now you can run the place. And the book of Acts just unfolds. All the stuff Jesus is doing, he's not there to do it anymore. The church is doing it. All the healings and the, and the visions and the, the preaching. You hear some of the disciples try to preach in the Gospels? They sound like me, a knucklehead. They're just using words, but, but oh, they had power and wisdom and discernment. And it was... Realized they weren't even putting on the uniform. They weren't even going out there. They realized maybe even these silly things, it's not even going to help. What I'm, what I'm going to need is the armor of the Spirit because the enemy's going to hate what we did. Look what they did to Jesus. Oh, he's going to hate what we're doing here, but I'm not scared anymore. I don't need to just huddle up and plan anymore. Seniors, 
You've had four years of huddling and planning and listening and chapels and Bible studies and, and highs and lows and wins and losses, defeats and, and, and times where even times where your eyes were open and they were, what is wrong with that dude? Happy when his circumstances are terrible. Encouraged when he had to take a semester off because he couldn't afford to stay here. What is this about these Christians? Some of you were watching Christians like from the sidelines going, I don't understand these people. Some of you saw that in your professors and your coaches. Some of you saw that in, in your teammates. And you often might have been asking, well, I don't know what makes them tick, but I want what they have. I got good news for you. Like we talked about at the table, you're invited. And it's a way better game than just coming out huddling up on a Sunday, getting all fired up, let's go, and then standing on the sideline Monday through Saturday and waiting to get back in that huddle again and be like, yeah, let's do it again, here, here, here we go, and it's not what church is supposed to be. Now, I do like a church that gets a little louder, and I really can enjoy the huddle, but the whole point is to get our marching orders and then go and watch it explode. Watch it birth from the, from the grass roots up. So watch it fall down because only the Lord could have nurtured and, and, and reigned these things. And so as we're walking through this story of the scriptures, I'm always looking for, okay, what, what are the plans that we're to run? Stay together. Find a church. Find a church that you love. Find a church that maybe, maybe you like a quieter huddle. Maybe you like a, a souped up bigger huddle. I, I, you decide, but stay together. And don't just run off. This is a team sport. You know what's cool? I didn't know this about tennis. But tennis, man, I, I learned something yesterday. Tennis, I never heard it described as a team sport. I always thought the team challenges were silly, like we just pretended. Oh, ENC won. Well, no, like five people won their tennis match. There was only one person playing there, you know? Oh, but here's what I saw. I never saw a championship before. I've, I've been at ENC my whole life. But the, what, what, I, what I saw yesterday was a tennis championship where they go like this. I'm there, and it, you got to win five games. Nine games are going to be played. Five games have to be won. We win the first four. So I'm already like, I mean, we got this, right? So five games are playing at the same time. And for the first time, what's really cool about this tennis match at ENC is I didn't get scolded for cheering. Every time I go to the tennis match, somebody, bam, they hit the ball, and I go, yeah, and they go, hey, 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 settle down, dog. And I'm like, oh, think more Wimbledon, less, okay, all right, all right. More Masters, like before Tiger, when we didn't get to Hoopa All right, I got it, I got it, I got it. But yesterday, the tennis match was crazy. These people, I heard them at graduation. I heard them, I'm not kidding you. I, I didn't get lunch, I'm not proud of this, but I ran through Taco Bell just to get something real quick. And then at Taco Bell, I rolled out my window, hand my car to a lady, and I hear, I'm like, what is happening? So I follow, I keep the window down, and I just keep, and the lady, I go to the lady, she, I go, she saw my face. I was like, what? She goes, that's been happening for like an hour. I go, what is it? She goes, I don't know. So I follow, I'm already headed to the tennis match, but I'm realizing, I think it's the tennis match, but I've been here a long time. No way is a tennis match this loud. Wrong. It was that loud. I had to play everything. I mean, people are climbing the fence, shaking it like this. It was great. That's my kind of tennis match, right? So they're playing. All right. And they pointed to the best player to the right. If we get a win here, we win the whole thing. So I'm watching over here. I don't really know. But oh, everybody's playing. Well, the dude on court four smashes this ball, goes, hits right on the line, goes out of bounds. He throws his tennis racket as high as he can in the air and goes, let's go! And all, five, all four tennis players who are still there, they're like middle hit like this, and they go, oh! And they just run. And they're like, yeah, bam! Bump and chess. I'm like, what just happened? They go, dude, we won the championship. Shaw Campbell runs over, grabs a trophy that has not been presented to him yet. And it's like, oh, let's go! <laughs> and then they start singing. I don't know what they're singing. It sounded like this. I'm like, what is going on? 
You know what it was? A team. It was a team. That's all that mattered. I started asking questions like this. Dude, what about the best player? He, don't his stats matter? Isn't he going to, is he a senior? No. But is he, so what about his record? What about the next level? Doesn't he want to be acquiring these like wins and losses and his aces and doesn't it matter? Everyone there knew that didn't matter at all. Not for a second. Not for the last. Nobody even stayed focused for just the, oh, we're celebrating? Let me get this last one in. No. No. Mid-game, they're just like, oh, let's go. It was awesome. And that's why we shoot off confetti guns when we open up the tub and we baptize somebody because everything should stop. All the protocol, all the, all the niceness and the, and the, and the pro, uh, just celebrate for a minute. Our team is growing. We're on to more wins. That means lives are being transformed. That means more light is going out to the darkness. You should drop everything and celebrate this. What was lost is now found. Come and party with us. That's the story of Scripture. Making disciples in the world. You remember Matthew 28, right? Jesus' last words to everybody. Hey, I gotta go. And they're like, what? No, don't. He goes, oh, you're gonna be fine. Wait and pray. When you receive what the Father has for you, make disciples. Baptize them. Wash them up. Get them to the table. And let go. And let the team grow. And let the team infect the world and change everything. That's the church I want to go to. That's what the church of the Nazarene did for me way back in the 70s when they didn't know this punk kid from Philly. I didn't know that all these people had already invested in college campuses. and They were naming buildings after people who had given their lives to make sure that this team was amazing. And so when I come into Christ and when I come up here and when I get invested in, and I'm just some knucklehead and, and they pour into me and I get some victories, they drop everything and come running around me and go, let's go. That's the church I go to. Find a church like that in your hometown, wherever you go, wherever you get that job and go be together, but be praying constantly. And quit with your nice prayers and pray fervently. Pray this emptied out because if you've been baptized, you know what it took. Being baptized, I don't know how they do it in your tribe or your tradition. And us, for the most part, we take people and we dunk them. And I mean all the way under. Your, your underoos, your, your, your socks, your, everything's going to get soaked because we believe now, when the Holy Spirit wants to get infected in you, 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 you don't want to just dip into that. You don't want to just sip on that. You don't just want to drizzle some of that on you. Watch. I mean, just, just watch. Because when somebody repents and they turn their life around and they, they really join the team, oh, everything changes. John 21, you might Google it, just speak it in your phone, Google John 21, it'll be right in the beginning there, Peter has already, I mean, this is after Jesus' death, Peter's already denied Jesus three times, Jesus is there to see it, Jesus called it, and said, dude, I know you say you want to be my best friend, you're about to, like in the next couple hours, turn your back on me, not one, not two, not three times, and he's like, what, no, I would never do that, and then it happens, like hours later, and Jesus is so cool. He doesn't like infect the, the, the scene and go, told you so, punk. He literally, though, watches it. In his hour of need, has one of his best friends who knows that he knows that he knows that he is the Christ. Be ashamed of him. So this is after the resurrection and after he's appeared several times, after he, he had people touch his body, after he, he said, go get me a piece of broiled fish. Let me, let me eat this in front of you. I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't eat fish. And he shows up and they're fishing. He says, hey guys, have you caught any fish? They said, no. He says, oh, well your, net, your net's on the wrong side of the boat. Throw them on the other side of the boat. They catch 154 fish. 
more, like an excess of amount. These people don't need breakfast, 154 fish. It's too much, God. But the nets don't break. He's got so much in store for them, and they don't even know it yet. They drag it all up here, and they already find that there's a fire here, and there's fish already being cooked. What? Jesus loves fish. He, they sit down, and he says, hey, let's have breakfast together. They bring some fish over. They cook some more fish, and they're eating. And he says, Peter, you love me. He knows what Peter did. He knows his heart, though. He wants to. And Peter goes, Lord, I, I do. My eyes are different. I, I do. I really do. He goes, would you feed my sheep? Oh, yeah, sure. They're eating some more. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, is this a trick? Yeah, Lord, I love you. I'm sorry about before. I love you. I'm in. I'm totally in. All right, would you take care of my lambs? Okay. They're eating some more breakfast. He says, hey, Peter, I, um, do you love me? Peter gets mad. Come on, man. What do I have to do? I'm sorry. I, I'm, yes, I love you. Jesus goes, would you, would you feed my sheep? Go and take care of my people. I love them. That's why before communion, he takes the towel around his waist. He gets down. He starts washing their feet. Peter's the first one offended. Oh, oh you're son of God. You know, I got to touch my bunion, right? I got corn. I don't even know what that is. My grandmother always says she had corn on her foot. I don't know why they had corn. It looked gross. All I know is any of the foot fungus commercials, they're always animated with cartoons, and they're gross. We don't have beautiful feet, except the ones in Scripture that what? what who, who has beautiful feet? The ones who bring the good news of Jesus Christ. And the posture that they're to bring it is like this. Give me your feet. You're nasty. You're funky. Let me help you. I got cleaned up. Let me show you who can clean you up. I love you. I care about you. You're more important than me. That's what he does. Now he's trying to serve breakfast to his boys. And he's already seen miracle after miracle. Even just this morning, you guys are professional fishermen. You didn't know that you shouldn't put your nets on the left side? They were right on the other side of your boat. You couldn't see that? Wait till they get radar. It'll be easier. But for now, I'll guide you. Feed my sheep. What's he say as he's rising up? Matthew 28. Make disciples. What you've been given, you didn't earn. You didn't pay for. You got it for free. So I need you now to spend your life freely giving it away. College kids, man, I know some of you. Some of you had your parents pay for college. You're lucky. You were lucky, all right? There's some people in here who had to work for every credit they got, pay it out of their pocket. Some of y'all got it paid for by your parents. I don't hate on that. I love that. Parents, well done. You, got, you know what your parents did to earn for that? They worked. They got a job. They kept going to work, and they worked hard so they could pay for that. But your college education, even if you didn't pay for it, it was not free. And Jesus has already, what did we just sing? Paid it all. And the only thing he's asking, stay together, pray constantly, continually, fervently, so that you can be so emptied that you can be filled with the fullness of God. You know what the fullness of God is? His Holy Spirit. That spirit he breathed into us, the Ruach of God. I don't remember everything from seminary, but there's a couple Greek words that I dig. One of them is skabala. You can look up that one. That's, that's, that's not for this sermon. But I do love the breath of God. You know what it's called? The ruach. You know how you have to say it every time? Ruach. You have to cough up some phlegm. If you're battling, like walking pneumonia, you're in. Like this is your word for a while. Lord, it's hard for me to breathe. Would you give me some ruach? You know, it's so cool because it's so intimate. Ian Sears, you might, have, you might have sort of encountered a God that was distant from you. But I pray that was not the case. If you have, if you're new into the space, if you aren't about that church life and you're hearing some of this for the first time, I just want to let you know there's no possible way 
a father gives birth to a kid and sees him and loves him and decides they're going to commit to him and doesn't want to be intimate, close, connected, honest and true and in relationship. That's what good parents want. It's what happens to us when we give birth. That's what God created when he breathed his own existence into us, formed us out of dirt and then brought us to life. It was with his breath. And the very thing that was now supposed to come out of us is the Lord's breath, light and truth and peace and joy and hope. Not anxious, not worried, not hurried, but a peace. And I struggle with that. I was singing here. My daughter started singing this song. I hear the Savior say, your strength in me is very small. Child of weakness, would you watch and pray? Because Jesus paid it all. I got to tell you, man, this week and my hurried and even my health, I have felt weak. And yet God has not been stressed. I come to him with, oh God, what are you going to do? I need help. And he goes, relax. My peace, I leave with you. I give you. I've got you. But stay together. Watch, pray, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit. Last scripture. Watch. This is ridiculous. And this, is, this is in nowhere dabbling territory. This is in nowhere like let's huddle up and then stand on the sidelines. Look what he wants to do in Ephesians 3. Paul, the same one who thought he was on the right road, killing off these Christians who seem to be creating an idol out of this Jesus. I just want to serve Jehovah. And we spent the whole Old Testament coming up with new gods and new kings and new, new leaders. And I don't want any of that. I just want God. So this Jesus thing was confusing to him. So he thought it would be his mission, his, his, his God-given mission, his church duty to just wipe out those Christians so we could get back to Jehovah. And then Jehovah's son steps in and grabs his attention and says, let me give you a time out. I just want to hang out with you for three full days. And I want to show you my fullness. It was so bright, so light, so amazing, so filled with awe that it blinds him. He can't handle it. And somebody has to come and interpret and say, that's who our Jesus is, the son of God. Paul now wakes up out of that and starts pastoring and seeing. And look what he promises here. Look what he says as he prays. He says, I'm praying for you, Ephesians 3. Start in verse 14. I'm bowing in prayer to the Father because of my work among you as your pastor. Because this Father is the head of us all, every family, not just the Jewish ones, not just the chosen ones, not just the, the insiders, but the Father of everyone you meet. He's the same Father. And he loves you. Verse 16. So I'm praying that he will use his glorious riches to make you strong so you can feed his sheep. I, I'm praying that his Holy Spirit would give him power deep down inside of you. Who Have any of you, and athletes, you get this. Have any of you accessed a power that you knew wasn't yours? It was deeper. You went further. You ran faster. You didn't have anything left to give. And somehow, maybe a coach, maybe a, a friend, or maybe just you decided, I can give more when it felt like there was nothing else. The Holy Spirit dwells in those places. Yes, on the surface, but in the deep. He says, I pray that the Holy Spirit would give you power from so deep inside of you that you could feed his sheep. Then Christ, verse 17, then Christ. Not before we gather and pray and empty ourselves so that we can be filled, but once we've been filled from the deepest places, verse 17, then Christ will live in your hearts because you believe in him. Do you want that? Come and get it. Don't leave this place till you get it. Don't leave this campus till you get it. Don't leave this Sunday service till you get it. Then, and only then, Christ will live in your hearts because you believe in him. And I pray that your love will have deep, Roots, the love that jumps down on knees to go, give me your feet. They're a mess. No, no, no. It's just, I can't. I can't. They're funky. I'm embarrassed. Hey, hey. I've been there. I, I don't mind. Love you. 
I'm clean. You, you should get clean. Come here. Now that's a love where the team drops everything and does our job. I pray that you will have a strong foundation. Verse 18, may you have power together with all the Lord's holy people to understand Christ's love so you together can feed his sheep. May you know how wide, how long, how high, how deep the Father's love is. And may you know this love fully, even though in this life you won't fully get it. It's bigger, wider, deeper than you can even imagine. Watch this, verse 19, middle way through. Then you will be filled with everything God has for you. One version says it like this. Then you will be filled with the fullness of God. I got to tell you, there have been seasons in my life I wasn't praying for the fullness of God. I was good with a little token vending machine. What do I need? An A1? Yeah, I just need a quick, I just need a quick snack. And a full, fullness? No, I'm, I'm just snacking on God right now. I just, that's what I need. Thank you. I'll take that. I don't even need it right now. I'm just going to keep it from my back, back pocket. I just want to encourage y'all, if you've never prayed for the fullness of God, you are missing out. You have been dabbling in half-price apps and just happy meals, just little kids' menu portions. But this is what the Bible encourages us to do. We can pray for the fullness of God. Jesus said, everything the Father has is given to me. You know what he's doing? He's giving me permission. Everything I have, I'm giving to you. You're welcome. And so I don't want to come to church, huddle up, learn the plan, and then wait on the sideline until something big enough happens and gets my attention. No, no, no. I want to pray for the fullness of God. Church, some of you, I see you. Your heads are like this. Because you know when I say, maybe you've never prayed for the fullness of God, some of you are like this. Oh, yes, I have. Oh, yes, I have. And the ones who are like, got a kink in their neck now are the ones who have said, not only did I pray for it, but he's, he's been saying yes to that prayer. Seniors, athletes or not, if you, if you graduated this weekend, why don't you stand where you are? Just let me see your happy faces. We, we had them up here in the pomp and circumstance, but then we wanted them to sit around with families. Go ahead and sit, stand up. Whether you're in uniform or not, if you graduated this week, if you, if you didn't graduate from ENC, I get it. Not everybody gets into this exclusive school. You had to go somewhere else. I get it. If you graduated this, this season in your life, stand up. I want to let you know. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we are proud of you. All the college graduates in the room, we know. It's not easy. It's a grind. And that struggle is real. And so well done. But I also like the fact that you're peppered all around the sanctuary. Uh, we've got some furniture that, that moves. We've got some furniture that doesn't move so well. But we, as temples of God, receiving God's breath, and his fullness, we are mobile sanctuaries, y'all, each one of us. If you've taken, if you partake at the table here, whew, you've already been filled. And you are mobile. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to mobilize a little bit, all right? Families, I'm going to ask you to, in a minute, I'm going to invite you to move first because I want you to huddle around your kid and embrace them. I know how proud you are. I know the sacrifice. I know the debt and, the, and, the, and the, the bank thing. You're looking on your phone right now like, oh my gosh, I don't know how we're doing this. So I want you to huddle in. I don't want you to pray for one another, okay? Then I'm going to ask the church as a whole. And first of all, I want to say on behalf of this church, thanks for allowing us to be your, your kid's church home away from home and we take that seriously. That's a serious responsibility for us. And we're going to huddle around you, the whole family unit. And as we send you, 
pray that the fullness of God would be enjoyed in your household, in your marriage, in your life. All right? And then we're going to go. And I hope, graduates, you are able to celebrate with, with holiness and with a whole lot of joy and take Sabbath rest as you travel and as you go, knowing that our God who fills you, he does not reside here, but he goes with you. If you would invite him in, he goes with you. Families, why don't you guys mobilize? Go find your, go find your graduate and, and huddle around them. And then church folk, I'll, I'll dismiss you in a moment to, to do the same, all right? Families, go ahead and move. Go ahead and just, excuse me, pardon me. It's good. Just get, just get in there. All right, Wallace and Church family, why don't you guys rise, find a huddle to be a part of, and join hands, link arms, and we're going to pray together. One of my favorite sights is a praying church, y'all. This is what we do and who we are. All right, I'll get us started. And then in your holy huddles, a few of you, a few of you might be a parent, might be, uh, it might be multiple ones of you. Here's what's really cool about our God. It's not like my grandfather used to say at our table, hey, I can't hear when everybody else is talking. Okay? He used to say that all the time. I was like, well, Grandpa, you, you should get better ears. You, you, should, you should be able to do this. Our God, he's got better ears. He can hear all of us when we pray at the same time. In fact, he calls it like this holy, joyous noise, and he knows specifically what's going on. All right? So I'm going to open us, and then I'm going to just release you to just pray. Pray out loud. Pray in your whispers. Pray in your joy. Sing a song over somebody, all right? Father, as we huddle in, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for this life that you breathed into us. Thank you for the spirit that you've now given us. Thank you for the son that came and repaired our relationships so we can even have this conversation with you today because we were lost in our sin. But now you've offered us forgiveness. Father, thanks for Eastern Nazarene College. Father, it changed everything in my life and I'm grateful every day. Father, for this place, we ask you to bless Thanks for the over 100 years heritage that you've already given us. And we know for fact there's more to come. Father, I'm praying that the best is still yet to come. Would you give us your vision? Father, for these graduates, we've been praying and praying for them all through their experience. We were praying for them when they were just thinking about it, looking on a website and maybe just filling out a card to even consider it. And here they do. Here they go today, walking away with their degree and saying, this chapter's finished, and we give you all the praise. Fathers, we release them and we send them out. We ask you to fill them with your fullness, clarity, a direction, a, a, a maturity now. Maybe, maybe you would even show them what's next. I've appreciated in my own walk, Lord. You, you love me too much to leave me just where I am. You take the next step forward and you say, follow me. And when I take that step, you say, great, I got another step forward. Follow me. And you show me the way. Would you do exactly the same thing? For these seniors today. Father, as a church, we say do the same thing. This table, this word, these places, this music, our worship, it's not ours, it belongs to you. You're the one worthy of it all. So lead us to the next step and we will follow you. Father, as the church begins to pray all together, Lord, would you fill us with the fullness of you? Bind us together in this team sport called the family of God and hear the praises of your people. Church, let me hear you pray, all right? Leaders, lead right out. You know how to do that. Parents, you know how to pray for your kid. You've been doing that since the maternity ward. Go ahead and let the, let, let the Lord just enjoy the, the praise and the prayers of his people. No magic words need to be said. Just share your heart. Go ahead, church. Pray it out.
Father, we are beyond grateful. I don't know what it is, but you love us, and you've decided to stay close to us. So thank you, Lord. Thanks for family. Thanks for this college, and thanks for the church family. We are grateful. We love you. Send us out with power given through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's some snacks in the back here. We're going to have small groups all over the sanctuary. So if you want to linger, jump in. Graduates, we love you. Go in his grace and in his peace.